Now the result looks much better. We can more clearly see the physical propagation of electromagnetic waves propagating away from the transmitter. And as we can expect, some transient fields are excited from the turning on of the source. So that's here on the leading edge of the propagating pulse. And that's from turning on the sinusoidal source at time t equals zero. Also, there appears to be some numerical artifacts along the axis of symmetry. You can see that right here. We will ignore that for the moment, but we should keep an eye on it. Now, if we ran this code longer, the waves would reach the PEC at the top of the grid and also on the right side of the grid. But we want our wave to encounter the ionosphere on this side of the grid. We'll deal with the right side of the grid later, but let's discuss the ionosphere next. For simplicity, let's start by considering the DC conductivity of the ionosphere. Luckily, this is reasonably accurate at VLF frequencies. The DC conductivity is only determined by the resistance of the ionosphere. In this case, we're going to have sigma of the ionosphere is equal to the electron density times the electron charge, and that will be squared, all over the electron mass times the collision frequency of the electrons. In this equation, the electron density here is in units of electrons per meter cubed. The electron charge and the electron mass is given by, let's see, the charge is minus 1.6 e to the minus 19, and the mass is 9.1 e to the minus 31. The uh, collision frequency describes how often electrons collide or bump into other atoms in the ionosphere. This value changes with altitude as 1.816 e to the 11 times e to the minus 0.15 times the altitude. And the altitude would have to be in units of kilometers. The electron density here, I gave the units already, but the electron density is 1.43 e to the 13 e to the minus 0.15 times the reflection height of the ionosphere times another exponential e to the sharpness, the sharpness of our profile, minus 0.15, and I'm running out of rim here, this would be multiplied times the altitude that we're at minus the reflection altitude. So since I'm using altitude here, I'm going to change height here to altitude to be consistent. And again, all these altitude values in units of kilometer. So this is a profile where the electron density increases exponentially as we go higher up into the ionosphere. And the sharpness here describes how the sharpness of the profile. Sharp is 0.5. We're going to assume daytime conditions. So sharpness will be 0.5. And the reflection height, or altitude, will be 75. So the reflection height is the altitude at which, or reflection altitude, is the altitude at which we can expect VLF waves to fully reflect on the ionosphere. It's in units of kilometers. And sharpness describes how sharply the profile increases. Putting all this together, you should use something like the code segment that's posted here. In this for loop, delta is in units of meters in our code, but these equations require units of kilometers. So that's why we're dividing by a thousand we're taking delta and multiplying it by k to get the total meters at each altitude in our grid, each k index in our grid, and we're dividing by a thousand to get units of kilometers. I posted this short code segment to Canvas where the slides corresponding to this lecture are posted. 
So if you like, you can copy this and paste it into your 2D FDTD model. In order to account for the conductivity of the ionosphere, which changes in the z direction, you'll need to make the CA and CB coefficients into either 1D arrays or, well, these are 1D arrays would extend in the z direction, it would be a function of k, or you need to have two dimensional matrices that would be, have indices of i and k extend in the x and the z directions. Either will work. Since the two dimensional FTTD grid includes two electric field components, we have both EZ and EX, we could define both CAZ, CAX coefficients and CBZ and CBX coefficients. But for convenience, since the half of a grid cell offset of these two different coefficients isn't going to matter much for the geometry we are modeling, I recommend you just uh, model just a single CA and CB arrays or matrices, and you can reuse them in both the, C, the EZ and the EX update equations. In these equations in your grid, epsilon is just going to be epsilon naught everywhere where it shows up in these coefficients, including in the ionosphere. And sigma, sigma has a subscript of k here because you're going to be using your uh, ionosphere values. You can extend these all the way down to the ground because they, they basically decay exponentially as you go closer to the ground. So it's going to change with the k index. So that we can see the waves propagate further in our model, let's increase the value for Imax. So let's make Imax equal to 500 grid cells. And since we're expecting the waves to reflect by the time they reach an altitude of about 75 kilometers, that was our reflection height or altitude that we used, let's model up to 78 kilometers. So set Kmax equal to 78,000 divided by delta. And this turns out to be uh, equal to 120. We also need to run the code longer so the waves have a chance to reach the ionosphere. So try nmax equal to 500. Keep plotting your EZ fields on a log scale so you can see the wave propagating. But this code is going to be slower because the grid is larger and we're running it over more time steps. So I recommend you plot every 100 time steps or so.